Hi, everybody, and welcome to A Heart for Writing, where we talk to all writers of all genres to help everyone at any part of their writing journey. My name is Joan Raymond, and I am a writing coach and author. And today I have a very special guest star. His name is Jack W. Peters. And Jack is a professional speaker and a trainer with focus on leadership, teamwork, and innovation. Jack's presentations are inspired by his international adventures from racing, treasure hunting, explosives, and television production. So let me bring Jack into the studio. Hi, Jack. Hi, Joan. (laughs) It's so good to see you. Great to be here. Thank you. Yes, we've been friends for quite a while. And um, so I've actually met Jack in person a couple of times, and he spoke at our writers conference. And so anyway, I was thrilled to have Jack on here because he's got some very special news coming up starting next week. So Jack, because this is a heart of writing, we do talk about writing. So can you describe, um, talk about where your heart, when did you find out you had a heart for writing and describe your writing process? Books are great, aren't they? And, you know, really the best business card in the world is a book. And books also provide social proof, right? I mean, you can talk a lot about a lot of different things, but books will give you credibility. And that's one of the reasons why I like them. I did my first book back in about um, 2001, and it was on GPS navigation. And at the time, it was a new technology when GPS receivers were being made available to the public and people started using them for hiking and fishing and hunting and going out and enjoying the outdoors. Now they're in everything. Uh, But back then it was a new technology. So it was a good time. And I kind of started my speaking and training, training groups, how to use GPS receivers. And I wrote a book on it and then wrote another book on geocaching, the sport of geocaching, and then some other books after that. And I've got four books in print right now with another one on the way at some point, whenever I can get it uh, finished. You know, it, it it begins with an idea, and the idea is to try to find a niche where you can get into a market somewhere that someone hasn't beaten to death. What is a topic that you're passionate about that um, not everyone else has wrote about? Or if they have, how can you put an angle or a spin on it that makes it unique to you? And a lot of times books begin with a title, don't they? It's like sometimes you think of a really good title, and it's like, oh, that's a book. And that kind of happened with the, the the most recent book that you'll you'll probably mention, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it begin it can begin with an idea, it begins with a title. You know, I I work with some uh, pretty professional authors, and I'm always inspired by other people that write for a living. And someone had said, start with the the description of the book that would be like on the back of the book, or that you would post on Amazon, or that your publisher would post. What's that paragraph or two that you would say about your book? Write that first and let that kind of inspire the rest of the outline of the book. Yeah, I like that because to me, when I write the blurb, I've written 91,000 words. Then I have to write a 250 word blurb at the end and I'm... I can't do it. I don't know why. It's like, you know, I got to go back. And I know what the book's about. I've written yeah. it. But, but anyway, so you start with the blurb first, the description. That, and that you... provides some focus for the rest of the book. I mean, for the right. outline first and then the rest of it, because, you know, it whatever you're writing, is it in your blurb? I mean, yeah. is it focused enough to be relevant based upon that topic without maybe taking a lot of side roads somewhere else? Now, I should say that Jack's books right now are all nonfiction. They're all, um, they're, I, I want to say like self-help and mm-hmm. instructional type books. So do you write it? Do you do an outline? Do you work with a strict outline or do you kind of just go for it? Yeah, that's the best way to do it is I, I go ahead and outline it. Mm-hmm. And then I expand upon the outline as each chapter, a section in the outline. And then I can... Uh, either consolidate chapters or expand on new ones, depending on how much material that turns into. Okay. Now, I have fiction projects as well. I, I started a, a novel trilogy that's also treasure hunting based uh, years ago, and I've never finished it. And I've got a lot of good stories and ideas. And I uh, one of the reasons, one of the excuses I have, because as writers, excuses is one of the things that we do. 
<laughs> is, uh, you know, maybe it'll be a television show or a movie, so I can't release it yet in, in paper form, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, you know, yeah. like some of my ideas, some of my babies I'll steal that could, uh, you know, end up in a television series or something. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah. you write the you write the book and then you throw it on Amazon. No. What do you do next? Well, you know, writing a book is a tedious and exciting thing at the same time. And I know a lot, a lot of people would like to write a book. As you know, most people don't or they'll get started and they won't finish it. And, you know, one thing I'll tell you is the years go by, you know, faster than you think. I know it's hard to believe, but I'm not as young as I look. And <laughs> I've started book projects. I've got one like on my novel copyright 2004 on that. It's not finished yet. Okay. So the years go screaming by faster than you think. And the thing is, when you when you think about writing books, you've got a, or any type of media project, whether it's a painting or a television show or a book, you are in the manufacturing business. You're not necessarily in the writing business. You're in the manufacturing business, meaning you have to build something. You have to come up with the idea, create it, finish it, put some polish on it, and then ship it off to market. You can't keep writing forever. And sometimes the people that film movies and shows and, and paintings, they mess with that piece of artwork for years. And if we're in the business to make money, if we're in the business to have someone else enjoy our book beyond our mother, right? Like the, the <laughs> actual public, we better do a good job at it. And that means we've got to, you know, do not only do a good job, but it has to be flipped and turned so it can be sold. And then we're off to the next project. And sometimes creative people aren't very good at that. They um, feel like if it's not uh, absolutely perfect, they can't release it. And so I'll often talk about the difference between excellence and perfection. Perfection is basically impossible, but excellence is achievable with enough work. Yep, that's right. Any big mistakes you've made when publishing? Because I know we've all made them. I mean, my first book, uh, the cover was terrible and I had to get a new cover for it. So any big mistakes you've made that you yeah, learned yeah. from? Absolutely. Um, we get anxious to release our work to the public, right? We want to mm -hmm. like get it out there as, as soon as we can. And I'm telling you, I've learned this from experience. Breathe, take another cold look at it, look at the cover, look at the editing, look at the format and say, is this really where it needs to be? And the nice thing is, is a lot of professionals like yourself that help authors do that. Now, there's a lot of indie writers right now and indie publishers, and there's really good people that can do editing, formatting, covers, publicity, photographs, everything that you need. Someone is out there willing to help you do that. Uh, the mistake I've made is I've released things too quickly. And there's nothing worse. And I know, you know, any author is going to experience this sooner or later or they have before is when you send out a book and then you get feedback says, Hey, we liked your book, but there's a typo on page 37. <laughs> oh, 30. Okay. I'll fix it. Oh, and 83. Oh no. 83 too. Oh yeah. And not a uh, 97 and 104. Okay, great. <laughs> Anything else? And it keeps, you know, right. So you want to avoid that. You want someone to be able to enjoy your work without saying, but there's a, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I agree. I have eight beta readers and my books go out and there's always one person that's like, you realize you forgot that A, you know, or a the, and I'm like, eight people and an editor. And, you know, somebody missed it. So let's talk about your latest book. And I have a graphic I want to put up here. So go ahead and talk about this book, Jack. Okay. Why, why was it so important? for you to get out? Because I know this was hugely important. This was a really fun book to do. And what inspired it is pre-COVID, I had the chance to talk with hundreds of young people, like 700 Boy Scouts and 300 and some kids at a school district and other groups. And it got me thinking, well, I get to talk to all these young people, these emerging professionals and these students and so forth. What do I wish someone told me when I was, you know, 18 to 25 years old. I mean, you know, like we always say, boy, I wish, um, you know, I was young like that. But the the, the trick is you got to know what you know now. You'd rule the world, mm -hmm. right? 
old people say that because you really need that extra inf information when you're young and naive, not when you're old and crotchety like me, but when you're, you know, young, trying to get through high school and college and trying to figure out what you want to do in life and all that. So I came up with seven simple things to consider. And I like desert racing. And one of the guys I went desert racing was telling us, you know, around the campfire once after a race, uh, he was saying, yeah, you know, he bought a shopping center and we're all like, how did you buy a shopping center? And he's like, well, you know, I, I didn't start with much, but I had some real estate and I bought some more real estate and I traded them up into some more rental properties and fixed them up. And eventually I could trade all that in and I got myself a shopping center. He said, I was the goldfish that barked. And I'm like, that, that's amazing. I love that. And by the way, I'm going to steal that for a book title. Yep. So, so, that's, the so that's, you know, there it is. And, and honestly, it's kind of funny because not everybody gets that. They're like the goldfish that bark. They're like, goldfish don't actually bark, do they? <laughs> well, you know, no, they don't wear shark fins either. It's a metaphor. Yeah. Okay. Lighten up people. We're going to get through this. It's a metaphor. But it's seven actions to distinguish yourself for success. And I think yeah. that's the amazing part. So it's, it's actually steps. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's a competitive world out there. And so how are you going to stand out among everybody else? Whether you're a student, whether you're applying for a job, whether you've just wrote your first book and you're, you want to make a splash on the market, how do you distinguish yourself? Well, there's, there's ways of doing that. And the nice thing too, is I'm not asking anyone to spend lots of money. You don't have to sign up for anything or spend lots of money. It's simple things that, that we can all do that we can think about that we can keep improving ourselves that essentially builds our brand because, you know, everything is a brand. We are too. We pay more money for a name brand. We want someone to pay more money for us, right? Based right. upon what we do and what our appearances of our products that we put out. Yeah. And it's definitely doable steps. I mean, a person reading it could implement them one at a time, but, you know, take time with each one and really study it. And I know you said like 18 to 25, this book, to me is for anyone who wants to, to be anyone. Absolutely. Right. right. Yep. All ages. Yep. So let's, okay. I was going to say, I wanted to talk about some other, you wear a lot of hats, man. You wear, you wear, you know, goldfish. Um, <laughs> you know, you're the author. Like I said, you're a speaker, you're a trainer. And so I want to talk about your off-road racing. You've been off-road racing. I mean, you're talking, getting in one of those little four by fours and, yeah, like South America. We're talking all kinds of, you know, places. Well, yeah, it's done primarily in, in Nevada and then also in Baja, California. Like coming up, we have the Vegas to Reno desert race in August where you actually get to drive as fast as you can on dirt roads, <laughs> essentially from, from Las Vegas to Reno or thereabouts with uh -huh. parties on each hand at the at various casinos and so forth in those cities. Mm -hmm. It's about the most exciting uh, thing and most challenging thing you can do. And it makes a lot of financial sense because you can spend like a million dollars for about a $40 trophy. So wow. it makes really good sense that way too. <laughs> but it's, it's, it sounds like, okay, so what's the fastest you can get in one of those, uh, vehicles now off-road the average speeds around 50 55 which the difference is you're going over rocks and rough areas and sand washes and stuff you're maybe down to 30 35 and then you get on a dry lake bed and you crank it up to 120 130 something like that but the average is somewhere uh in the 50 mid 50s range for miles per hour and like Vegas Torino, you're, you know, it's 14 to 16 hours, depending on how fast your, your car or buggy is. Mm -hmm. And then you have a driver change, co-driver change. I do co-driving, which I'm the navigator and radio guy. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not doing that, I help out with the race organization and volunteer as a, an official to help with the race. So have you ever become airborne or upside down? <laughs> Uh, I've been pretty lucky, but I have friends that have scars from crashes and anything can happen. And it's, it's pretty wild when you're going that fast. You imagine going over hundred miles an hour on the freeway. Now, if you're in the dirt with rocks and cactus and, and uh, you know, ravines and that sort of thing, you can get yourself upside down pretty quick, but there's a lot of safety gear involved. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of safety equipment. There's a fire suit and helmets and, and special belts and flame out systems and, uh, and we have radios and tracking beacons and we have a lot of safety equipment, but sometimes we use all that stuff up when you need it.
<laughs> so is someone actually tracking each vehicle the whole time during the race so they know they, where they are? Yes, they do that now, which is really neat because logistically you can see where your car is in relationship to the other cars you're racing against. There's multiple oh. classes. Not yeah. everybody races against each other. There's trucks and buggies and UTVs and so forth, mm -hmm. motorcycles. And by having that beacon, it's a safety issue. You can pull up on a screen like a video game and you can see your, your people racing. It'll tell you how fast they're going. So if they're stopped somewhere on the course, you know they've got problems. But if they're driving and they're moving, then you, it shows that via GPS and you can tell where your people are at so you can intercept them if they need parts or uh, help or whatever the case is. So kind of like Cannonball Run, but, you know, maybe more legal. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I mean, it <laughs> sounds like fun, doesn't it? I mean, it's, you know, what could go wrong? <laughs> absolutely nothing, especially with parties on both sides, which I'm sure have no adult drinks at all involved. No, nothing like that. Um, so, Tequila, <laughs> so I like racing. And, you know, what's interesting is when I do my corporate training, a lot of my racing is, or I'm sorry, a lot of my training is inspired by racing because I think uh, racing sure. is more fun than dealing with old academic theories on management it's more fun to learn about you know how would carol shelby do it you know when he yeah. beat the corvette and then he beat ferrari and so forth learning these lessons i mean these extreme uh conditions and events tend to magnify lessons and it makes it more fun and more memorable for old guys like me to try to remember you know how to learn these business lessons if you can uh, frame it up as an example from racing well and with racing you've got to You've got to be in the game, I mean, literally, and yep. you've got to keep your mind straight because things come up and you have to know how to handle ups and downs and emergencies and in business, there's always, you know, it's never a flat terrain. Boy, I'm really using all these that's metaphors. Right. <laughs> no, that's excellent. It's like you've been to the training already. It's awesome. Oh, yes, I know. Yeah, so, no, you know, you, you can have me focus. help next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a here and now. It's all about focus. Right. And it's also knowing where you're going. And like off-road, we have checkpoints. There's like 12 or 13 checkpoints mm -hmm. from start to finish. And we have to know that, you know, it's, it's hard to look at a race and say, can we drive a thousand miles in Baja or 530 in Nevada? That's overwhelming. But if you know the next checkpoint's only 60 miles away, well, you can do that. Yeah. And then when you reach that, that's a milestone. Then you go to the next checkpoint that's maybe 70 miles away or whatever it is on the map. And we're using GPS to make sure we're on track. In business, it's the same way. Uh, like when you're writing a book, each checkpoint is a chapter, right? Right. I was I just going to say, said, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because people are like, like my last book, 91,000 words. And they're like, how do you do that? And it's like uh, basically one chapter at a time. I don't think about you know, that it's 55 chapters long because I have shorter chapters. I just, I right. write the next chapter. I write the next chapter. And sooner or later, I get there. But I mean, right. I know where yeah. I'm going. Yes. If yeah. you told someone, okay, I want you to write 55 chapters, their eyes would glaze over and they'd, they'd run, you know. Right, right. And, but it's like, well, yeah, but if each chapter is, say, you know, 40 pages. I, or, oh, you five, know, pages, okay, yeah, five pages, 10 pages. Yeah, Five, 10 pages. You can do that, right? Okay, good. Yeah. Chapter one, you just reached the, you know, checkpoint number one in the race, you yeah. know, and, and then you build momentum because statistically every um, paragraph, every chapter you finish, your chances are better of finishing this race that's until right. you get to the end. And when that's where you want yeah. to be, then yeah. you have your celebration with adult that's right. beverages. <laughs> no, that's right. Okay, so your education, this one thing in your education really fascinates me, the Shipwreck Archaeology Field School. I, oh. I'm fascinated about that. Mm -hmm. so. I like uh, shipwreck archaeology and that just, you know, f studying uh, primarily Spanish galleons, old shipwrecks, Spanish galleons, that sort of thing. Uh -huh. I really enjoy that type of uh, adventure of shipwreck archaeology. I'm a scuba diver and I cut my treasure hunting teeth actually on the coast of Oregon, which is in the news a lot right now, Nehalem, Manzanita, Oregon, is one of the most beautiful ocean beaches in the world. That's a secret. Um, and it's up, kind of up by Portland, but not quite that far north. It's above Lincoln City and Cannon Beach area. Most people don't even know where it's at, but there's a Spanish galleon there uh, that, um, depending on which galleon you think it is, came over at... 1694 or something or 1705 uh, but it's there and it's been washing up 
debris on the beach for hundreds of years. And uh, my associate there, Craig, just found a bunch of timbers and they're removing those timbers now uh, in the back of a sea cave to go to be preserved up at the Columbia Maritime Museum uh, in Oregon. So wow. that, that story is in the news right now that just broke like last week, but that's how I cut my teeth on doing research. Mm -hmm. that, that's not a, a treasure hunting project per se. It's a, it's a archeology span project, uh, but uh, that got me interested in researching other galleons and other projects. And that got me into doing the treasure quest series and, and other ones beyond that. So before we talk about the treasure hunting treasure quest and your new show coming up, which is exciting. Nice. Um, so treasure hunting and detonation blasting, I mean, you know, blowing things up. You enjoy doing that explosives, yeah. I should say. So how did you get into, um, because you are, you're also the president of the American explosives group, which is a, training for blasters and public safety. So, I mean, you know a lot about safety when it comes to detonation and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into that? Well, the main, the short answer is I don't want to get bored. You know, I mean, <laughs> the neighbors and the cops and stuff know that I shouldn't be getting bored. Yeah. So I, I enjoy a lot of adventurous things and uh, I've been involved actually in public speaking and training since 04. And then when the economy tanked in 08, 09, uh, I actually got involved in explosives training because the price of gold was shooting through the roof. And uh, that was an opportunity to do that type of training when other companies were laying off their workers. And so I've been involved in explosives training since 09, and I still do that today. I work with miners and uh, construction and demolition guys, as well as public safety first responders for explosives awareness and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I still do that today because I really enjoy it. I, I enjoy blasting. And I've had the opportunity to do, uh, to mix some of my passions that include uh, treasure hunting and blasting for television. <laughs> and yes, and I'm going to show yeah. this picture. So, so yeah, um, the producer, a producer called and said, Hey, do you want to, you know, go off to an exotic location and join a team of, you know, professional treasure hunters and use explosives and look for a billion dollars in lost treasure. And I'm like, well, you know, I think we could probably work something out. Let me check my <laughs> schedule and see, you know, so. So the name of the series, and I call it Jack series, but it's really not Jack series. It's, it's, not a, mine, no. it's a Netflix share series, the pirate gold of Adak Island. And for those that are going to be listening on the podcast later, can you explain what you're wearing in this picture? Well, I'm standing in a bomb crater in the little island of Adak, which is in the Aleutian Island chain in Alaska. So when you look at the state of Alaska, you see a little line of islands that go out to basically Russia. That's where we're at. And those islands have a lot of history. During World War II, they were actually, two of them were actually occupied by the Japanese army. And they set up an air base on Adak Island to fight the Japanese and get them off those islands. Uh, but they were occupied for over a year. And so there's a lot of unexploded ordnance on those islands from the military base and from the conflict with Japan. And uh, the mayor, Tom, Mayor Tom called and says, hey, you know, we're looking for, you know, millions and millions of dollars of these gold pirate coins that are hidden on the island. A couple containers have been found so far. We want to find the other 164 or whatever containers of gold coins. But we've got a bomb problem. Uh, do you mind coming out and helping take care of that? And I'm like, I think we can work something out. So um, what I did is I flew out in a Cessna full of explosives. Don't tell the insurance company or my mother, uh, but we flew, <laughs> we flew out this little airplane a thousand miles from Anchorage and landed on this island, uh, which actually has like the population of maybe six or seven people and some sea otters at this point. Uh, and then they showed me they had a actually a World War II era uh, bomb that was in the way of their their quest for these coins. And so I, um, in episode seven, you can have a look at me taking care of that issue. Yeah, and I was going to say, so this um, this series actually is going to premiere, uh, and this podcast is, I mean, this well, this broadcast is being uh, recorded uh, Friday, June twenty fourth, but it will go live on YouTube on um, Tuesday, 
um, June 28th. And so for people that are listening, if you go check out Netflix on Wednesday, June 29th, and here's the name of it again, it is Pirate Gold of Adak Island. And like Jack said, he is in episode seven. So, yeah. you know, if you fast forward to number seven, you'll get to see him if you, but you'll miss all the, all the stuff in the beginning. So, well, yeah, but don't for the, for the sake of the show, watch it. It'll be good. In oh, fact, yeah. the, the producer that did this show did the first 13 years or so of deadliest catch. Oh, wow. Uh, it, okay. It's, uh, you know, really high quality uh, production, great people and a great story and a fascinating Island. I had no idea of all the history that, Alaska had for the second world war on these islands out there. And it just, it, the whole thing's going to be fascinating and, and you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Quick question. Cause we're going to be out of time here pretty soon, but cause I remember you told me when you went to go film, I mean, you were, you were right getting ready to put your book out and you wanted to make sure that book got out no matter what. But yeah. when did you guys actually film this? How long did it take before? It was over a year ago. It was yeah. about almost a year and a half ago now. And usually it doesn't take that long, but COVID um, was a big, not only was a, a COVID a big damper on the whole world, it was a big damper on the film industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, every, everything had to be separated and delayed and, and logistical problems. So it just, you know. Yeah. But the whole uh, point is, is that things like this don't happen overnight. I mean, it's like people no. that write a book, it still can take quite a while before it comes out. And you did this show a year and a half ago and it's finally premiering I finally know, coming out yeah i was afraid they were going to call me and say well you made the cutting room floor congratulations <laughs> but apparently well, not i guess i guess they kept me in so that's well then there'd be a big hole and you'd have no way to say what I, how it i got know there, right you know? i mean you, you know it can't cut me out so <laughs> <there you go. laughs> no so uh, the one last thing i want to bring up is you're awesome at speaking i know you've you've spoken in front of a lot of groups and um, you just recently National Speakers Association um, in Las Vegas. Yeah. So can you briefly talk about your association with the National Speakers Association? Yeah, National Speakers Association is a great group and they have chapters all over the country. Uh, my home state is Oregon and I was active up in the Portland chapter years ago. Now I'm moving to Las Vegas and active in the chapter there. And here's the thing. They say, well, if you've got a speech, you've got a book. But I could say, if you've got a book, maybe you've got a speech too, right? And you may have a video series and you may have um, a podcast. And, you know, like once you can create your own content, it can be used for multiple things. And, you know, it's funny because people are afraid of public speaking. It's like the top thing that they fear, you know, like speaking and then death and then like, you know, something else or some ridiculous thing, statistic, it's really not that bad. There's, there's um, assistance you can get to learn how to speak. You get comfortable in front of others and build that confidence. Then you can share your book. Maybe you read, you know, chapters out of your book. Maybe you do training based upon your book or what inspired you to write the book or how can your book inspire others. There's a lot of speaking that you can do that can spin off from having your own book or books. Mm -hmm. And, and public speaking, you don't have to start with a thousand people. I mean, I, when I was president of our writers club, it was probably 30 to 60 people. And that's a good way. I mean, I know there was a lot of people that wouldn't even get up in front of 30, but right. I got very used to being up in front of 30, 60, maybe a hundred people. And other people would be like, no way. I, you know, it's, I'd rather do anything, you know, root canal or something. Oh, I know. That's and funny. For me, it's like, no, I'd rather, I'd rather speak than fly. I, I don't really like flying that much. And especially when a one with explosives in it, but um, like you did, but you know, I would rather, I would rather get up in front and speak and I'm very comfortable yeah, in front of people. Not, you know, you just, you, the thing is, is you got to realize things might go wrong. And like I, I told Jack before we did this broadcast is he said, well, if we make a mistake, I'm like, you know what? I'm treating this as live. If I mess up my words, I'm just going to keep going because there you go. that's who I am. I mean, I, I'm not afraid of making a mistake or fumbling words because that's that's life that's who people are and um i think you're more realistic i think people uh, appreciate you more you know if you make a mistake so i think the trick is i think what makes people nervous is they try to memorize what they want to say and then mm -hmm. when you try to memorize you know however long your presentation is it's hard to do that you got to internalize it because the other trick about 
picturing the person in the front row naked. That <laughs> that never works. I always no. get like the big construction worker or something. I'm like, no, no, God, wrong audience <laughs> for that. It just doesn't work. Yeah. And so yeah. So you got it. You got to have it. You got to speak from your heart. You got to internalize right. what you want to say. What you are telling someone else should be so important that you're willing to travel across the country to say it. And mm -hmm. it's got to come from your heart. And when you think about speaking in those terms, it's a lot easier. And plus yeah. the edit button helps too. And then you can always chop it out if you get That's wrong. true. But That's you true. You can't do that on stage. Then you're back <laughs> to looking at the big construction worker guy naked and then it throws <laughs> everything off again. Yeah, really. Uh, the first couple of speeches I did, I used to have it written out word for word and boy, it messed me up every time. And mm -hmm. now I make a few notes, but otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, it's easier to focus on what the other person's saying too when you're interviewing, if you are truly listening and just looking at a few notes. Jack, right. thank you so much for everything. You've given us a lot of tidbits. This has been fun. Um, I'm gonna show one more time the picture of the show that Jack will be on starting next Wednesday. Well, from whenever you're listening on this, Wednesday, uh, June 29th, and then I am going to show his uh, latest book one more time, The Goldfish That Barks, Seven Actions to Distinguish Yourself for Success. That can be found on Amazon, and also um, in the link um, in the description of this um, broadcast video, there's going to be a list of links where you can uh, find Jack, and if you need him to speak at one of your, your um, <clears throat> functions, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to chat with you about that. So, do I have time for a parting shot here? Uh, yeah, just a small parting shot. Okay. And then Write your book. It is your legacy. Write your book, but before you release it, get good help. Hire someone like Joan to make sure all the editing and formatting and everything looks great. And I'm telling you, it's a lot of work, but once you do it, it's worth it. You'll be very proud of your accomplishment, and you'll encourage you to do another book. Uh, thank you, Joan. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so great to be here. Thanks, Jack. So anyway, thanks uh, Thanks again to Jack Peters. Jack W. Peters. Sorry, I'm used to calling him just Jack Peters. But um, thanks again to Jack Peters. Um, all the information about this uh, broadcast will be in the, sh in the uh, show notes or description. And um, as, as a writing coach, I just want to encourage you, if you're having challenges writing, I have a seven day, uh, it's a free video series on overcoming blank page syndrome. The, um, the link to that is also in the description. So thanks again um, for being here and um, I hope you join us next time.